The scripture reading this morning is from the Hebrew scriptures. This is Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why do you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do for the people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of God for the people of God. So, today's scripture is about a crisis on a long journey. When I was 24 years old, my best friend and I planned our first big trip of our adult years in our big adult jobs. We took a whole week off. At the time, my sister lived in L.A., and my best friend's uncle lived in San Diego, So we planned an epic trip where we'd spend the first half of our long week with my sister in Hollywood, West Hollywood, and then we'd take the train down the coast and spend the second half in the nice warmth of San Diego with her uncle. And we arrived on Friday and we had this amazing weekend. We ate sushi and fish tacos. We went shopping. We did people watching on Venice Beach. We did hiking. We hiked that West Hollywood hill and saw the big letters. We toured all the homes of the stars, and we saw all L.A. had to offer over that long weekend. And then Tuesday morning, we were awakened by calls from our parents because we were under attack. Two planes had flown into the World Trade Center that day in New York City. We spent the majority of that day, like the rest of America, huddled on my sister's couch in shock, watching the same newsreel for hours on end, slightly paranoid about whether L.A. was next, and we tried to decide what to do. At one point, my friend insisted that we go home. We had to go home right now. We had to go home immediately, walk or run or drive. Her heart was compelling her to return to the safety of home and her family. It was a natural reaction, surely, since, but since all the flights were grounded, we didn't have a lot of options. I ended up talking her out of renting a car to drive cross country, or maybe the rental companies were shut down, I don't really remember. Either way, we ended up using our pre-purchased train tickets and arrived at her uncle's place in San Diego the next day or so. (coughs) Excuse me. And then, a few years later, that same friend and I were on another road trip, and we drove overnight after the end of my Friday night shift at a fish fry restaurant to Atlanta, Georgia from Chicago to see John Mayer in concert in his hometown. Neither of us had ever been to Atlanta, and it sounded like fun. We took our best duds, our greatest clothes that made us look fancy, our good makeup. We went out on the town after the concert. We went to Peachtree Street, which is in all of his songs. And the next day on the way back, we headed to Nashville because my college roommate, lived right outside Nashville, and I thought we could stay there overnight and it would shorten our trip. It was a good midway point. So we met them in Tennessee, and we went to a mall to have a good dinner with her and her husband, and we parked our car in this pay-to-park grassy lot with the help of a man in an orange fluorescent vest, and when we returned following dinner, there was no car. It was just gone, along with our suitcases, all of our fancy duds and makeup, our road music, her textbooks, my glasses, her boyfriend's camera, 
our pillows and bedding that we had made a bed out of the back seat for the person who wasn't driving overnight. And I'll never forget my VHS tape of my one and only skydive that I wanted to show my roommate and impress her. Clearly, my best friend and I have come to the conclusion that she and I should never, ever, ever travel together. But in that moment, in that crisis point, my first call was to my college roommate. I said, don't leave. Please don't pull away. We don't have a car. We need to hitch a ride with you to your house. And after that, I'm almost certain that our next call would have been either to her mom or to my stepfather to ask what to do. What do you do when you're standing in a grassy lot with your purse or your wallet and nothing else? You call your elders for advice. <coughs> I'm sure one of them told us, first of all, to calm down, that it would be okay. And then they probably advised us to call the police and the assurance company ASAP. In the meantime, my friend was shutting down in a panic attack, that feeling of personal invasion that happens when your car is stolen from you was getting to her. I was a lot more calm, but of course it wasn't my car or my bedding or my textbooks. <laughs> we ended up renting a car and driving back. And her car was discovered a week later or so in a church parking lot without tires, trashed up on blocks, with most of our possessions gone and anything left ruined. But what was weird was that on the way home, after we had successfully rented the car, gotten enough to eat, gotten sleep, and we were driving well on our way, I remember that we were both irritable with each other. We were doing a bit of griping and grumbling and murmuring in the car. It took us a few hours of the trip to realize how vulnerable we felt from that theft and that loss of our things. And we had to make a pit stop to do some retail therapy, buy something that we could hold on to to say that we were back in control just a little bit of our, of our lives. <coughs> in our scripture today, the Israelites are out of control and feeling very vulnerable. They are still wandering in the wilderness. They have seen God's plagues brought upon Egypt. They've seen the majestic waters part They've known God to respond to their cries in times of need and to feed them from seemingly nothing. And yet still, they howl and complain again that they would have been better off if they were still slaves in Egypt. They're all on board with this idea of following God into the wilderness until the going got tough. They were all angels at first. And then they became panicked Second guessers. They began to sabotage Moses and the plan. Now, it is pretty terrifying to be without water. In general, a person can survive for about three days without water. This must have been a fact that the Israelites knew, and indeed, it's fresh in our minds given some of the things going on in Gaza and other places in the world. The Israelites are in survival mode, and water is essential to their survival. They were very afraid, and fear does not bring out the best in us. These Exodus people only know one existence, that of a slave. They are used to having direction, to being directed, to having rations and decisions made for them, not relying on their own inner chutzpah and critical thinking in crisis. They have worshipped the Israelite God their entire lives, but they have relied on their Egyptian captors and never really learned to rely on God. <coughs> in their fear, in their inexperience with faith, and in their thirst, they start making frantic demands of Moses and thus God. And Moses' frustration is understandable. What more do these people need to see? God has freed them from slavery with seven plagues visited upon the Israelites. God has parted the Red Sea to protect them. Moses doesn't understand why they cannot pray for God to supply their needs in the wilderness instead of attacking him. So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. 
How many of you can identify with Moses' frustration? Has anyone here ever spearheaded group change in their workplace? Has anyone started a new fundraising initiative on a nonprofit's board? Led a school or a classroom through, say, state required testing that has changed? Have any of you parents, well, any parents, have any of you lived through maybe a family road trip? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> or maybe a move to a new house? Or has anyone here planned an, a group trip to some international destination? Or, dare I say, is there anyone here at church who's tried to build out new ideas here in church? I know every transitional pastor who's charged with leading change can identify with Moses' frustration. How about managing a church through the anxious experience of COVID-19? Even in the most conscientious and understanding churches, and this is a conscientious and understanding church, I know there are probably still plenty of wishful thinking and anxious grumbling about when would church regather and how is all this mask wearing going to affect our congregation. We've all just been through a wilderness experience. <coughs> Excuse me. In her book, Daring Greatly, Brene Brown that oft-quoted, insightful sociologist, author, and popular speaker. Who's heard of her? Okay, there's some. In her book, she says that when you get into uncharted territory like COVID-19, or like leading change in an organization, or like being on vacation during a major terrorist attack, your brain searches for a frame of reference for what you've seen before to help you interpret and make decisions on what you're going to do next. And if the brain can't find any frame of reference there in your files of memory, it panics. And in panic, you are more likely to abandon the destination, to sabotage the plan, or even resort to decisions that you've made before, even decisions that have failed before simply because those decisions are familiar. It is in these hard places, those wilderness experiences, that we hear the cries of people who test and quarrel because they are afraid and uncertain. You are more likely to wish, wish for the slavery of Egypt over the uncertain, uncertainty that lies before you, even when you know that what lies behind you, that slavery was pure misery and despair. You are more likely to give up on the idea of your long-planned vacation simply out of fear and anxiety. You are more likely to abandon the goals of change and then say, well, they never would have worked anyways because you don't know where your next step should come from. Do you have anyone in your life like that? Is there anyone in your family or community that acts in fear, acts out in fear of the unknown? Is it you, maybe at times? Is it someone around you? Who do you have in your various life situations that is most apt to abandon goals or sabotage new initiatives because it makes them feel vulnerable? When have you been that person? Even though you have been shown time and again that crisis can be managed, change can be good, and God is indeed with you on that journey. This is the lesson that Moses has been trying to instill to the Israelites, but ultimately calls on God to finish it. He says, I give up. And so God completes the idea that despite the conditions around them, and the uncertainty before them, God is present and is always responsive to their cries. They demand water and turn on Moses because they are tired and thirsty and frightened of the unknown. But reliance on God is the bedrock, the foundation to the covenant, 
between God and human beings. They test Moses and they test God because they have not previously been people who have relied on faith. But there are some interesting things in God's instructions. They offer some wisdom, and I love this. I feel like it's kind of an instruction manual for us when we're facing that kind of murmuring and grumbling. First, God says to Moses, walk out. Walk straight in front of those people. Even though you think they're going to stone you, go to them. God doesn't allow Moses to hide or to avoid the grumbling or the complaints or the anxious pains. God says, go straight into the fire. Go face the metaphorical firing squad, but take a few elders with you. And God says, bring your staff, that powerful staff that is capable of wonderful and terrible things. Remind people about that staff that brought down the plagues and parted the Red Sea. And then use that staff to give people what they need, to give them water, but to give them what they really need. Because Moses knows what they desperately need is to build a faith that trusts God. The Israelites need to learn how to pray rather than grumble. They need to learn how to trust rather than react. They already had to request God for their daily bread, and they were granted according to their need. Asking for our daily bread is an invitation to God to walk with us. God walks with us in the wilderness, in all of our wildernesses, and encourages us to call out in need rather than aiming fire at the messengers, at the Moseses and the prophets in our lives. God is trying to teach the Israelites a faith that relies on God and each other. Because it's always in the wilderness where we encounter our elders, the witnesses to the divine, the prophets who foretell of God's promises, who stand with the prophet Moses, supporting his leadership and offering encouragement. These are elders who remind us of the promises of God, who help us reiterate those promises to others. We all need elders. Those who remind us when to lean on faithfulness and God's vision, instead of anxiety and the human's brain, which is limited to only referencing the things in the file of what's come before. What do you do when all the people around you are making decisions based on anxiety? And how, and it will impact you. What do you do? Who do you call for, in a crisis for encouragement? Who are the elders that steady you in the wilderness of change in your lives? And do you cultivate those voices who offer you support and encouragement and calm in the face of anxiety? Do you collect them and nurture those relationships and hold on to them because you know you're going to need them someday? Or do you let the anxious voices dominate? Who would you bring with you to consult, to help you hear the voice of God and the call to the nearest rock with your trusty staff at hand to bring forth a rush or even a drop of hope in a season of doubt? This story in the Bible is trying to build a bridge of vulnerability between human beings and God and human beings and each other. And we see in the story is the rock, the symbol of the church later in the Bible. And it's also from which water flows, where God is present in a hard place. That rock is a reminder right there when they name it, Meribah Masa, that vulnerability is the best, best method to express your needs to God and your needs to others that we can bring our vulnerability to church and we can sit in vulnerability in prayer. We can share our anxieties and our fears with God and with each other. It's a reminder to be brave enough to ask for help or for reassurance rather than grumble with sabotage. And it reminds us that God designed this whole world to run on compassion and connection. And that requires us not just to be charitable, but also to be vulnerable. 
There are so many times when we are called to abandon anxiety in favor of trust and lean on those who encourage rather than grumble in order to witness to the faith and power of the one who provides and the way we manifest those blessings in our lives and in the life of this church. Today, may we continue or begin anew with a sense of renewed trust and dare the vulnerability that makes us all feel like we will survive the wilderness that surrounds us. May it be so. Amen.